who is the executive director and co-founder of Cape Town Youth Program, uh, which is this position sitting right now. He grew up in Cape Town, he's been here since birth, and um, he's done incredible things for the community, making real change to the way that the young people hear education is amongst his children. And he was recently, in 2012, he was honored at the CNN Hero for his talents work. And um, he's also in charge of national and international fundraising for this organization. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce Tulano. Individual people 
so you never get your specific time with the teacher. If you miss something today, that's it. And then the next time you come across that kind of uh, subject or chapter, it's where you take your exam towards the end of the year. So, yeah, that's why then we introduced the tutorial program. And then the next thing that we also felt we needed to do was sports, because in Africa, we love soccer, especially in the townships. When you get back from during the segregation times in South Africa, most black people were playing soccer. And we found that it was very important for us to also have other interesting activities. Because when you start to tell the kids that they've got to do their homework every day between four and six, it's something that is very new to them. And you've got to make sure that you also bring some interesting things that are going to drag them into the program. But as much as we are willing to change our community, we wanted to work with those young people who also wanted to change their own lives, not just everyone that we come here, because we also wanted to be sure that we're not just a drop-out place where everyone who doesn't have a place to go, they can just come here. And that's when we created our membership form. It's actually free to become a member of the Twitter Youth Program, but you've got to sign a contract with us that commits you that you're going to be here every time that you are needed, which is mostly when you are between the first and seventh grade. That's Mondays to Fridays, four to six. And uh, when it's winter, it's four until 5.30, because as I told you that there's no electricity in our community, so it gets dark very early. So that's why the kids will leave at 5.30 in winter. And then, in addition to that, we wanted to remind our kids that the services that we give them they're not coming out as a handout. They've got to earn whatever that they're doing. Because in communities like ours all over Africa, you find people tend to be beggars, you know, they tend to depend on other people. So we wanted to ensure that we remind our brothers and sisters the importance of human dignity. You know, to say, you don't have to, when you see someone, you just want to ask a dollar a rent. Because the apartheid South Africa has taught black people that uh, white people are better than them, and they are rich than them. That's why in, in our country, as long as you are white, you are wealthy. People will come and ask you money, even if you are facing the same challenges with them. And then, also, we feel that our kids, just like me, have never been part of Johannesburg before I went to Boston in the U.S. And we started building partnerships with schools, because we are very fortunate that we are not tourist destiny, so some tour operators will stop by here and then we'll take people around, show them our community. And then that's then we started to build partnerships. But I was mostly um, inspired or motivated, or that's where I found myself in 2005, when I became uh, one of the first 120 young South Africans to be part of the CTA program, which originates from the States. Uh, it's a national youth service program which recruits young people from diverse backgrounds in terms of education, race, religion, and then they bring them together for a year of service. So it's about building democracy through citizen service. And then we flew to the U.S., met President Clinton, and then we're just learning about social entrepreneurship because in our community, things like social entrepreneurship are not that much acknowledged. It's just something that you're doing. You know, and that's why we don't have many young people really interested into social entrepreneurship. If you had to ask most of the kids around Cape Town, what do you want to do when you finish school? They'll tell you, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be an accountant. Everyone, no one's going to tell you that I want to be a community worker or a social worker. And then we also realize that with our young people wanting to be doctors, lawyers, accountants, do they know that what do those people do on a daily basis? So that's then we started to think about things such as career guidance, where we'll invite accountants, uh, lawyers, and all the people on site to come and share with the kids that what does an accountant do every day? Because some kids think when you're an engineer, you wear your nice suit and tie, sit in your office, not knowing that you should go on the construction site every day. So then such things started to open up our minds uh, as an organization. Uh, but to cut the long story short is that this is an organization that was founded by young people from the community who saw the need for this program because we wanted to be that generation that was going to break the poverty cycle in our community. Because the way things work in our community is that 
you are raised in your one room or two room shack with your family. Once you get maybe eight and you have a baby, you create your own shed. That's how life has been going. So in our first year, we were very fortunate uh, to help the young people, about 21 of them, pass their 12th grade, which is a big challenge in our community through our after school program. And then uh, as we speak, we have introduced about 21 students into college and university. Some have done some trade programs because we also realized that there were young people who do one grade for about three years. And those are mostly people that are not academically gifted, but their parents will force them to stay in school so that they can become doctors. And they're not real doctors if we have to face reality. So such people will direct them to welding, to plumbing, to electricity, some things that they can do with their hands, and then they are able to succeed. And today we are very proud to say that when it comes to plumbing challenges, we use our own young people to do that kind of work within our program. We don't have to hire anyone to come and do that for us. But the most important thing to do was to empower people where they're good at. You know. For us, we felt that it has worked so well for us because if somebody is interested in electricity, just empower them in that direction. You know. And then for young people that have been dreaming big, which is there's nothing wrong about dreaming big, about wanting to be accountants, doctors, or scientists, we also help them to understand that if they don't make it there, what's the next option? You know, for us, we strongly believe that it costs nothing to believe in a child. So that's why we continue to believe in our kids and tell them things that their parents wouldn't tell them. We've been fortunate to travel to other parts of the world, like the US, um, Turkey, China, and every time where we go, we are hosted by families. And we see when kids go to school, they are told how much they are loved, how much they are appreciated, how much their parents care about them. And then when you come to Cape Town, we are always told how useless we are, you know, how stupid we are. And then such things also contribute towards our development as young people. So every time we just continue to remind each other how special we are within our program. And we always mostly encourage boys to spend time on the mirror because they forget themselves. You know, it's only girls that are always in the mirror. And then boys sometimes forget how much the, how handsome they are. And as much as you want to start realizing that, then you're gonna respect your body, you're not gonna abuse alcohol, not gonna abuse drugs. And sometimes in a community like Cape Town where people are living in less than a dollar a day, we ask ourselves that where would people find money for alcohol? Where would people find money for drugs? So yeah, we becoming kind of like an alternative to those social challenges in our community. We currently set in for the children and youth. Every Monday through Fridays, we give them sandwiches before they go to school. When they come back from school, they'll come also to our kitchen and get a hot meal. Because in a community like Cape Town, not everyone is fortunate to have food whenever they want. As we speak, thousands of kids here never had breakfast and still not sure what they're gonna uh, have for lunch. So the other thing that we educate our kids to do is to always think globally but act locally. You know, whatever that we do today can impact on the world tomorrow. You know, and not to always feel that they are the worst. Because I, I remember in 94, South Africa was celebrating its first democratic elections, but at the same time, about millions of people were dying in Rwanda. So we always need to be appreciative of whatever that we have. That's what we always encourage our kids. And one thing that we also tell them not to do is to compare themselves with other young people. Because where we go to school, sometimes we attend with kids who come from very rich families around Soweto. That's why we really appreciate the school uniform idea in South Africa because it makes everybody look equal, look equal. Because if it's a holiday or at school, they say we should wear um, our own clothes, it becomes an automatic holiday for our kids because they're scared to go and be embarrassed. Because in schools where they go, some kids will be wearing the Nike sneakers, the Nike t-shirts, while they don't afford that. So I feel like we appreciate the school uniform idea because it always gives our kids pride to go to school. 
And that's why as an organization, every year in January, we provide <coughs> full school uniform to our kids. Because we know that the school uniform sometimes can make a huge impact on your life. Because some of us never own school uniforms while we're still in school. And that was also contributing towards our low self-esteem in class. But once you are sure that I'm wearing my school uniform, I can do this, then you get to do that. Uh, at this time, people, I'll invite questions if there are questions from you. And of course, we're more than happy to answer any question around KYP. Thank you. Uh, my name's Adam. I'm from the U.S. Uh, was there a lot of resistance from the community when you first tried to develop this? Yeah, Adam, the, the, the challenge with our community is that um, whenever when we're going to some, introduce something new to the community, you should be ready for <laughs> failure or success. But the most important thing is about belief. If you believe in what you do, then people will also believe that's going to work. Yes, it's just like in any other community around South Africa or Africa that not everyone was really sure that we're going to be where we are today. And then it was also a big challenge for our members to be part of the program because their friends, maybe when it's time to do homeworks, their friends will be walking around the streets, you know, having fun. And then our kids will think that they were missing out, not knowing that they were building their own future. Uh, but in terms of the community in general, we got a lot of support from many parents because they knew that the work that we do is something that they, can, they couldn't do. Because as I told you that, my mom went to school until the seventh grade, and if I could have worked at the eighth grade level, that would be a nightmare for me. I'll take you, then I'll take you, say. Okay, I'm fourth come from Canada, and what about the plan for the future? Oh, KYP. Yeah, the plan for the future. Our plan for the future here is to, we've been researching a lot uh, about um, the, 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 the jobs that are available in South Africa, but we also want to create uh, job, uh, job makers here, yeah, not job, job seekers. So one thing that we've been doing, we've been partnering with different institutions where we're learning about different entrepreneurial uh, skills so that uh, maybe we can have a lot of businesses running our, uh, in our community, but also it's more about ensuring that our children or students are no longer just passing their 12th grade, but they pass them with good grades that can allow them to get into institutions like Vet University or maybe qualify for programs like ANA, so that once they get that kind of education, then you are assured success. And then also, at a broader level, we also wish to expand our, our knowledge to learn more about how to do we take care of you to the next level. And we don't see ourselves having other branches around Africa or Soweto because we strongly believe that this program has worked well here because we have ownership of it. This is something that we started, we lived this life, we know those challenges and we do have possible solutions. So the way forward is to see our young people succeeding, getting into teacher institutions, studying their own jobs, studying, uh, working in big companies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm Daniel from Singapore. Yeah. Uh, my question, you mentioned 70-80% uh, unemployment. Yes. Uh, is, this, is this figure like based on like um, formal employment or does it also include the like, employment from the, is it like the 20-30% bar employment? Uh, is it formal employment also shadow, there's the shadow industry that comes around here? Yeah, this, this is mostly around the, 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 the formal employment okay. because there are also a lot of people who try to make a lot of initiatives like having the stands, selling candies and other things that people like around the community and most of our mothers working in neighboring communities as helpers, you know, but they are not registered as employed people and those are the people that will make about five to six hundred friends a month, you know, and uh, there will be uh, less than a thousand people in this community that have like good jobs where like they work in banks or other things less than a thousand. Yeah. Uh, and, and the usually like taking home 500, 600 rand a month, uh, how much, what percentage of this is actually goes towards um, typical household expenditure? Yeah, it differs with the house to house because at home, my mom, there were eight of us, I've got seven siblings, and we lived with my mom. She earned about 400 rand a month by then. 
And all of it was mostly spared on food, honestly speaking. Yeah. And basic things like soap and other things so that you can wash. So when it comes to clothes, school trips and other things, even today in, in our community, when there's a school trip, an educational trip that you wish to live, because the reality is that no one enjoys to live in a community like this. Everyone wanna see themselves living in deep roof extension or living in Sentin, but you have to work hard to get there. And the most unfortunate thing, some people have made it, because we do have people who have lived in a community like this one, who are now senior people in big companies. A typical example is a guy who's called Spiwe, who works for DPS now, it's a diamond company. Well, one of them say we live here in Cape Town. It's about how to educate our community to give back. You know, because Spiwe today, his salary, like he lives in Pasonia. Pasonia is one of the most wealthy communities around Johannesburg. And he never even helps even one or two children in our community. And growing up in a community like this, uh, I think he would know the challenges that the kids are facing here every day. And he would do, I would do anything to help the kids if I had that kind of a job. But people like him will also use as an example to say, if he has made it until to senior position at DPS, you can also do it if you believe in yourself. Yes. 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 My name is Boyd, I'm from the Czech Republic in Prague. And my question is, is there, of the 45,000 people, there's one family wife? No, unfortunately, in Soweto as a whole, we've got about 3.5 million people, if I'm not mistaken, in Soweto as a whole. And there are about four whites, which are the Roman Catholic nuns, who live somewhere around here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wonder what, because I'm sure there's white families around Johannesburg, yes. South Africa, they're in similar conditions. Yeah. And they have like their own areas where they. Yeah, it, it, yes, in South Africa we do have white people that are suffering, but the reality is that they never suffer like black people. If they say they are suffering, maybe they have a four-room house instead of having a 20-room house. Well, in Cape Town, when we're saying it's suffering, we're talking a one-room share. You know, we don't have white people who are using them in South Africa. You know, they may be somewhere in an other part where I don't know, but around Johannesburg, when you go to a, a poor white community, that would be like a middle class for us here. Are we dying to live in that community that they would regard as a poor community? Interesting question. 
Uh, the question is to run this program, what's the cost? Uh, we're currently using about 1.5 million grants in South Africa. I'm not sure how much is that in US dollars. And um, we mostly raise our funds through our performing arts. We also have a lot of uh, volunteers from the US and China who have been helping us to raise funds. Like now, we just came back from a four week trip in Boston and San Francisco where we did uh, some fundraising there. And it's mostly families and individuals that have made this work succeed in, in, in our community. And uh, those are mostly our families that have came and visited our program, have seen us since 2007, and, and they've continuously been seeing us growing every time. So those are the people, because in our recent fundraiser, we raised about 80,000 US dollars. Uh, and that's a lot for us as an organization to raise. In addition to that, as Ghana mentioned in his introduction, that last year I was fortunate to be amongst uh, the top 10 CNN heroes. We, and we were selected from about 45,000 people from 100 countries. And that alone comes with a, a gift of about 50,000 US dollars to our organization. So now I can be sure to tell you that we've got about 180,000 US dollars that we have to run our program for the next maybe 12, 13 months. And then, tell me, any other question? <laughs> yes, I'll take you. Um, Excuse me. Okay, I'm just that. Well, so, so, do you manage to get mainly eco equal splits between boys and girls, or do you, you maybe see a bit more uh, predominantly male? Uh, in, in, in our organization, we mostly have girls participating in our program, which is nice. Because in South Africa, we're mostly talking about women empowerment. That's one thing that uh, has been encouraged. Because uh, during the segregation time, even though black people were oppressed, but black mothers were even more oppressed because they never had voices even within their own families. So today, women of South Africa are very fortunate because they are women of equality. They can be whatever they want to be. It depends on you what you want to do as a woman today. And for us, again, we also feel that as much as we are so passionate about empowering women, we also need to ensure that we don't leave boys behind. Because uh, the reason why we believe like that is because, yes, there's nothing wrong. We can continue to empower the girls. But maybe in 30 years' time, we'll have to start uh, men empowerment. So we don't want to do that. We just want to do it. Uh, it goes together. But of course, spending more time on the girls. Because we want to be sure that... They say when you educate a woman, you're educating the nation. But when you educate a man, you're educating an individual. We have proved some of those things. When you are left with your father, you use, use 100 friends for a day or two. But your mom will spend it for a week. So, you see, those are some of the things that we always stand for. Yes. Uh, my name is Rafa um, from Singapore. Yes. Uh, my question is regarding electricity. Is there a kind of youth movement that is really discussing with government to bring electricity here soon or all the government to go with that the people in this community they're taking it for granted that they will never have electricity? Um, good question. For, there are a lot of uh, people in this community that have been trying to talk to the government in terms of electricity. We are part of those people. That's why we ended up like having to raise funds for the solar panels because it's so hard to function in a community like this where like there's no electricity to power your computers and to provide basic light. You know, it becomes hard for the kids. So. Yeah, people are talking to the government, but it's mostly the community leadership in general. It's not young people. And then some people don't know that it's their right to have electricity. You know, so that is why days like today, you also want to make sure that you remind people that why we're at home today, why people are not at work, why we're not at school, what does Human Rights Day mean? Those are some of the things that we need to talk about. But some people say that for me, I also feel that it's very dangerous to always be pointing fingers because one of the people I met here and the other time, he said, some people have never been on top 
it's always easy to point fingers there on job. And that's why we never find another president, a former president, criticizing the current president. Because they know how does it feel to be there. So I'm wondering that maybe one day I will be there and I will be able to provide electricity for everyone. And then it will be to say, we don't want to point fingers, but of course we're going to try what we can. As I said again, that no one enjoys living in a dark community. You know, so, yeah, we'll continue to try for that. Yeah. Okay, we'll take him, then we'll take him. Um, yes. My question, I object from India. Yeah. My question is, how much time did it take to start this like, uh, program? Mm -hmm. How much time did it take to start this program? We mostly use the appreciative inquiry, right? Use what you have to start the program. And then when we started our program, it took us four days. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that was like, okay, guys, we know each other. We grew up in the same community. What can we do about our community? Okay, let's start uh, this dancing club. Okay, we're going to be dancing. And then that's how it started. You know, it, it, the, our advantage was that communities like these, you also, as the Bible says, when you are weak, that's when you are strong. You get a chance to be together. We play together every time. So when you want to start something, it's easy for you to get a buy-in from your friends. And then when we started, we knew something that wouldn't cost us money. What we did, we said, let's dance. It doesn't cost money to dance. And we just danced. And then we did a lot this time one day. How much time do you think it would take? I mean, expected time to be like this? Yeah. The truth is that when we started, we never saw ourselves as people who were starting an organization. We saw ourselves as some people who were just starting a youth club that's going to keep young people away from the streets. But we ended up like being this organization that we are today. So there's nothing wrong about starting small. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, Karachi. Do, do you face any pressures when you uh, reject people who want to be admitted to your program? And it's so, how do you cope with that? Yeah, that, that, that's the one of our biggest challenge. Uh, that's when, as I said, we work with 400 children and you. Cape Town is more than 10,000 kids. Yeah. And sometimes it's very hard, in most of the times for us actually, to say to the kids, yeah, we've got 400 now, it's okay, we are full. But what we have done, we have created a waiting list. So if we have somebody who's not honoring their contracts with us, then we'll call their parents, we'll replace them with somebody that is on their waiting list. And at the same time, we're also educating our community that not everything will always come for everyone. You know, and it's about who is serious for that kind of particular problem. And then that's how we, we do it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. That uh, how did we create this organization? Maybe, if I'm not mistaken, we're saying coming from these challenging backgrounds that we faced. Uh, the truth is that not everyone in Cape Town is like Tulane or Town or Sipo. You know, it's also about who do you associate yourself with. Some of the people, if they say, if you wanna be successful, just try and associate yourself with successful people. Then you're gonna be. And we've been very fortunate that some of our friends, some of our mentors, are people that have uh, done very well in their different respective professions. And every time we get to meet with them, we do ask. You know, at some stage I was very, very shy. I, I found myself asking that question. Uh, in Boston, uh, two years ago, I was fortunate to be hosted by Paul Ejani, who's one of the Boston Celtics owners. And I was like, how did you get where you are? Well, I know. And some people will just tell me that work hard. But I want you to unpack what is working hard means. It means to get good grades now, 
then apply for college, then apply for a job, then if you unpack it for me just like that, then I know what should I do. And then it's just like us. Some people will give us books like the one for in the one hand book. You know, like study business in the community. Some people will say to us, you know what, there's a lot of macro more programs that can run, you know. You also have to look around the realistic things that are existing within your community. But it's the motivation that you get uh, from other communities. When you go out there and you go to Bosnia Natal, where we go every three months. When you get there, coming from crypto, you feel like you are rich. Because they have got kids who are walking like 20 kilometers to school with their bare feet and hungry. And then here, yeah, yes, we are suffering, but we are assured that we're going to have one or two meals a day. You know? But in some communities, it's more than what you're going through here. So such things makes you us feel that, oh, we're still fortunate we've got one, two, and three. Let us just use it. And then at the same time, educating, I see some of my colleagues are starting to like, hey, yeah, thank you for your oh, oh, okay. yeah, sorry. Yeah, my name is uh, Peter, I'm from Canada. Um, as a teacher, I feel very uh, privileged to have met you and seen this. Just in kind of a follow-up question, with the num large number of kids on the waiting list, are there any plans for expansion, maybe not on this site, but opening up another another place in, 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 in the other community? Uh, unfortunately, that there are only few places or centers like these in this community. There are only two, it's this one and the other side. But uh, the reality again is that, uh, as I said, we don't see ourselves studying other branches around unless it's going to be here in Cape Town, just an expansion. Because um, we feel that if you can take us and say, let us go and start a program like this in Eastern Cape, we may feel this month. Because you don't know the challenges there, you don't know what you people need, you don't know any other thing. But within Cape Town, if yes, we had an extra space, that was going to be something that we consider. But not consider because of we've got a long waiting list. It's also sometimes about you as an organization to say you just want to be a dropout organization, or do you care about the number of the kids you work with, or do you care about the impact you're making on the children's lives? So it's also about that question. And for us at this stage, it's more about the impact that you want to do. It's not about the numbers. Because yes, it's good sometimes to tell people that we're saving 5,000 kids. But if you're not touching those kids very deep, then we're not doing anything uh, for us. So that's also another thing that we have to work around. Yeah, I'm Bill from India. So my question to you is, how do you decide which students will be a part of this program? What is your criteria? How do we decide which child can take into the program or not? It mostly works on a first come, first serve basis, but we mostly give first preference to those that were here the previous year so that we can see that we've grown up with them. And then, yeah, they also have to show a lot of commitment. If you were with us last year, but you missed the classes, you missed the activities, then we have to drop you. And then there's also nothing wrong about dropping a, a, a child. You're educating them that they've got to be accountable to everything that they do. Because with us, most of the times, we are not that, we're not taught that way. If somebody brings the candies, we know that, oh, we are going to get, you know, and it's not going to work like that every way, you know. Does it mean that you renew your contracts every year? Yes, we renew the contracts every year. Yes. Yeah, every January we renew the contracts. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, I'm sure I'm from China. We talk about how some people have become successful, successful and they destroy. How much happens to have from them to keep up as successful? Uh, in our program, uh, dear, we only have about five students that just got permanent jobs. And the, re, the proposal we have sent to them is that next year we would wish, we would love to see them supporting at least two children within our program. If each of them can support two kids, because it costs about uh, 1,500 rents for a year for our children to go to school. So if those students could start to say, I can pay that maybe 200 a month or whatever, that's our wish. This is their first time they're getting formal jobs. So. Yeah, but they know that as from next year, here is a challenge that we put in front of them. Because we want to be sure that 
we need to give back. One of the guys, the Kenbe Mutombo, is a, a former NBA player. He said, if a, an elevator takes you upstairs, you need to send it down to bring others up. So that's what we're also asking from the kids, uh, from the young people that already have jobs. Uh, I'm now from Pakistan. Mm -hmm. I want to ask how do you think this model is sustainable or how is it sustainable right now? The money. Yeah. Like money. Every, money. Every, yeah, the entire project. The, the entire project, how do you make it sustainable? We always engage our students to check ourselves if we're still relevant to what the activities that we are doing. And then if something is not broken, don't fix it. You know, we just add whatever that needs to be added. And at the same time, while we try to sustain the programs that we do, we set our standards and then we help our students to, to meet them. We're not going to lower them because uh, so and so cannot get uh, 70% of mathematics, then maybe we say we need, say, 60. No. We just set our standards and then we help our students to meet them. And then if they've got challenges in doing so, then that's then we will also try our different uh, initiatives.